Mexi. Well, I think we could all use some good news this month. Luckily, that's what I've got for you, care of countless dedicated activists worldwide. So cheers, comrades. Thank you for serving up these sweet, sweet capitalist tears. Bolivian coup criminal and neoliberal stooge Janine Añez was found hiding in a box by Bolivian police after failing to flee to Brazil. She's been arrested on charges pertaining to her role in the illegal coup that ousted Bolivia's former democratically elected leader, Evo Morales. The wheels of justice are beginning to turn against those who attempted to usurp the power of the Bolivian masses. Ghana is set to prioritize its own domestic production of cocoa products and stop exporting raw materials to Swiss chocolate companies. This is part of a broader push to take back neocolonized industries that have exploited Ghana as a producer of raw materials alone. This month marked the 150th anniversary of the Paris Commune, the 72-day social upheaval that became an iconic blueprint for workers' revolution. To mark the anniversary, the mayor of Paris, Anne Hidalgo, planted a memorial tree in Montmartre, and Place Louise Michel, named after the most famous female communard, was filled by Parisians carrying life-size silhouettes of the bakers, shoemakers, and washerwomen who seized control of the capital in 1871. Called Nous la Commune, the event has kicked off a series of exhibitions, lectures, concerts, plays, and poetry readings that will last until May. According to Laurence Patrice, the Paris councillor charged with overseeing the anniversary, it's time the revolutionaries of 1871 were recognized as radical pioneers. We are talking about a large group of citizens who came together to take their destiny into their own hands, she said. There was a modernity to what the commune stood for, and its aspirations were close to what some people want today. The communards battled to have legitimate, accountable political representatives, they wanted to give the vote to women who played a huge role in the commune, they defended equal pay and requisitioned empty homes to house the homeless. The commune offers citizenship to foreigners and free access to the law. There are lots of echoes with today. The Scottish government has announced that Scotland's railways will be nationalized next year. The government will take over the franchise run by Abellio when their contract is up in 2022, after years of poor performance and industrial disputes. Unions and transport campaigners have been calling for the move for years. Organizer Kevin Lindsay said we welcome the beginning of the end of the failed franchise system here in Scotland. Never again should the People's Railway ever be in the hands of the privateers. The first independent trade union has been formed in Uzbekistan after labor violations were reported in their cotton sector, including years of forced labor and child labor. Several corporate entities entered the cotton market after the fall of the Soviet system. One of them, multinational Indorama LLC, signed an agreement with the state which confiscated land from farmers and gave it to Indorama via quote-unquote voluntary land lease terminations. This is straight-up primitive accumulation or accumulation by dispossession, and unsurprisingly Surprisingly, many farmers who transferred their land to Indorama voluntarily, without compensation, say they are now worse off than they were when they produced cotton for the state. They complain of low wages, temporary contracts without sick pay or pensions, poor and difficult working conditions, unpaid overtime, refusal by the company to permit labor leave, and coercion to perform tasks outside of their duties. In late February, in response to threats to further job cuts, about 300 Indorama workers held a spontaneous meeting where they announced the establishment of a trade union. It is not yet being recognized by Indorama, but solidarity with workers there who are determined to force change. The Spanish government is planning to test out a four-day work week where workers will make the same amount while working fewer hours, with the government paying the difference. The pilot could begin as early as this fall at the behest of the center-left party at Mas País. The only red lines are that we want to see a true reduction of working hours and no loss of salary or jobs, said Hector Tejero of Mas País. Lessening time at work actually boosts creativity and productivity because it helps overall worker well-being, although taking care of worker well-being should never hinge on productivity. Other countries are also considering the four-day workweek, including New Zealand and Finland, and France has currently capped their workweek at 35 hours. Right-to-work laws have been defeated in Montana and Colorado, which will remain free bargaining states. In Montana, although Republicans have control over the entire state government for the first time in over 16 years, union members and other workers have successfully pushed legislators to vote no on right-to-work. In Colorado, a similar bill was voted down by the House Business Affairs and Labor Committee. Mark Thompson, a member of the United Brotherhood of Carpenters and Joiners of America, testified against the bill, saying this is union-busting legislation it always has been, always will be. Fantastic that organizers have been successful in squashing these bills. 
The people of Nicaragua, like many in the global south, are unjustly bearing the brunt of climate change caused predominantly by actors in the global north. Higher temperatures, storms, and disease are taking their toll on coffee production, putting pressure on farmers to migrate, but not surprisingly, most would rather find a way to stay in their homes. To that end, a cooperative called Sopexca has been working with over 600 small-scale coffee farmers, helping them to diversify and develop new methods to keep their incomes up as their harvests are challenged by rising heat and storms. The cooperative, which sells to fair trade buyers in Europe and the United States, provides training to farmers on how to better care for the soils and forest cover in a changing climate, working with farmers to build resiliency. We in the Global North have a responsibility to fight for climate revolution, as it is criminal that the people who contributed the least to the crisis like farmers in Nicaragua, suffer the worst of its consequences. Last month, we reported that GMB, the union for UK's Uber drivers, scored a historic win as the Supreme Court ruled in the union's favor and determined that Uber drivers are workers, not independent contractors. This was the fourth time that judges ruled in GMB's favor at various court levels. As of the 17th of March, all 70,000 UK Uber drivers are being paid holiday time, have been automatically enrolled into a pension plan, and are earning at least the minimum wage. The union wrote that other gig economy companies should take note. This is the end of the road for bogus self-employment. Thousands have rallied this month across the US and Canada in solidarity with Asian Americans and Asian Canadians after the racist and misogynist attacks in Atlanta this month. While some may think that this is only a US problem, there has been a surge of anti-Asian racism in Canada as well, leading thousands to come out and demand action in Toronto, Calgary, Montreal, Vancouver, Penticton, and the Tri-Cities. Something not talked about enough is that the sexualized violence that Asian women face has been deeply shaped by American and Canadian imperialist wars in Asia. The New York City Council voted to end qualified immunity for police officers, becoming the first city in the U.S. to do so. Since 1967, qualified immunity has prevented officers from being sued or held liable for misconduct. City Council Speaker Corey Johnson said it had been used to deny justice to victims of police abuse for decades. The city passed several other pieces of legislation aimed at police reform as well, including allowing the Civilian Complaint Review Board to investigate police with a history of racial profiling complaints, as well as giving support to a state bill that would give the board final authority on discipline recommendations for officers, where previously the police commission had the right to disregard recommendations. Looking forward to one day seeing a world without the racist armed protectors of private property. Led by unions, 5,000 people marched in a suburb of Athens this month against police brutality. Banners read money for health and education, no to repression and intimidation. Cops out of our neighborhoods and intimidation will not work. The workers' struggle will break it. This was in response to a brutal beating of a young man who protested cops harassing families in the Athens neighborhood, which went viral on social media. Over the past months, there have been many marches and protests against police repression in Greece, mainly led by youth and students. Detroit Will Breathe, a popular movement formed on the streets of Detroit during last year's mass uprising against police brutality and anti-black racism, sued the city last fall, seeking to ban the use of batons, riot gear, tear gas, and rubber bullets against protesters. They were granted a temporary restriction on law enforcement. In response, their municipal government made a counterclaim against Detroit Will Breathe, stating their use of these weapons was justified because the human rights organization allegedly conspired to cause civil unrest and harm police officers over the Summer. But this month, a federal judge dismissed the city's claim on the grounds that they failed to provide adequate evidence proving that any conspiracy occurred. The city's countersuit was clearly meant to intimidate and incapacitate the movement, but DWB activists who have been subjected to horrific state violence while exercising their civil right to protest are now off the hook for hundreds of thousands of dollars. Bristol, the city that gave us this iconic video of protesters dumping a statue of a slave owner into a watery grave, has just called for a parliamentary commission of inquiry to be set up to develop a reparations plan for the UK's role in the slave trade. City Council said that the experiences, voices, and perspectives of African heritage groups were needed to help develop the reparations plan for Bristol, which is the first authority outside London to approve such a measure. Green Party councillor Cleo Lake, who proposed the motion, said this is about equity and understanding. 
understanding. Reparation does include but goes beyond monetary compensation. It is of international significance that this cross-party motion has passed. History is made. Bristol is now the first core city in the UK to give our support to the growing campaign for reparations. Speaking outside the chamber, she said Bristol merchants grew rich through African enslavement and this legacy is still with us, not only in the buildings that surround us, but also in the rife inequalities of wealth, power, and opportunity across our city. We do not have the answers as to exactly what reparations should look like. That's why what we're calling for is a process of repair which hears from many of the voices in our communities that have been impacted and are often not heard. While this is clearly the early start of a complex process, it is undoubtedly good that this is even being brought up at all in official institutional settings. There's often a lot of talk of reparations but very little action, so this step is certainly moving in the right direction. Students in the Seaman School District in Topeka, Kansas are organizing to demand their school district be renamed after it was uncovered that its namesake and founder, Fred Seaman, was an exalted cyclops in the Ku Klux Klan during the 1920s and a prominent figure for the Klan in Topeka. 35,000 people signed their online petition and the movement has manifested locally with students organizing several demonstrations, drawing support from other students, parents, alumni, and local activists to demand the school board change the district's name. They are still pushing, but it's inspiring to see how passionate these kids are and how effectively they have organized. In Melilla in Morocco, one of the two Spanish enclaves in mainland Africa, the city assembly voted to remove the last statue of Francisco Franco, the fascist dictator who ruled Spain for 40 years. This month, workers took down the statue from the city's gates that had stood since 1978. The only objectors to its removal were the fascist Vox Party, arguing that the statue commemorated Franco's military victory in colonial war. Thanks, we hate it. The Chief Minister of Gibraltar has given notice of a motion that he will be putting forward in Parliament that will set the date for a referendum on the legalization of abortion. On June 24th, citizens of the British Overseas Territory on the Spanish coast will vote on this critical component of women's liberation. Abortion is currently punishable with imprisonment for the practitioner in Gibraltar. All of the families, seven in total, being held by immigration authorities at the Berks County Residential Center have been released to live with sponsors across the U.S. Unfortunately, this does not mean that they have been granted asylum, they must continue their immigration cases, but they can do so while living with relatives or others willing to house them rather than in federal custody. The next step is to permanently close the center so that no future family or child is forced to go through what these families have endured, said U.S. Senator Bob Casey. Absolutely close the camps. The Sapporo District Court ruled that same-sex marriages should be allowed in Japan and that not allowing same-sex marriages violates Article 14 of the Japanese Constitution, which prohibits discrimination because of race, creed, sex, social status, or family origin. This is the first time a Japanese court has made such a ruling, and although it does not have any immediate legal consequence, it is a moral victory that could bolster efforts for legalization. Solidarity to everyone fighting for marriage equality in Japan. In the first case funded by Good Law Project's Trans Defense Fund, UK's High Court determined that parents and children can consent to a child taking puberty blockers without needing to involve the courts. Previously, even when a specialist doctor wanted to prescribe puberty blockers, a child wanted to receive puberty blockers, and their parents believed puberty blockers were in the best interest of the child, an application would still need to be made to the High Court. This has happily been reversed, but trans children without parental support will still remain disadvantaged, so further work needs needs to be done to remove the barriers for trans kids to access the medical care that they need. The Canadian Supreme Court rejected an attempt from big telecoms businesses trying to block the introduction of lower internet prices. Canadian internet prices are among the highest in the world, with the market dominated by big players like Bell, Rogers, and Videotron. In August of 2019, the CRTC determined that the rates charged by these major telecom and cable companies for internet services for at least the past five years were not just and reasonable. In fact, they were unjustifiably high. But lower internet prices have not yet been introduced since these companies have made various appeals, but with the rejection of their request to appeal to the Supreme Court, the ruling of the FCA stands, which rejected their appeal unanimously 3-0. to zero. Businesses will likely apply for further appeals to delay the process, but this is a good sign suggesting that they will have no legs to stand on and internet prices may need to be lowered in the near future. Fantastic as the internet should be a public utility available to all. 
Fracking is now banned in the Delaware River Basin. The Delaware River Basin stretches from New York State through parts of New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Delaware, and Maryland, and provides drinking water to 17 million people. It is also critical habitat for countless species of flora and fauna, including trout, American eels, and bald eagles. Four out of five of the members of the Delaware River Basin Commission, including the governors of New York, New Jersey, Delaware, and Pennsylvania, voted for the ban in a historic move. Given that hydraulic fracturing produces water that is so toxic it needs to be removed from the water cycle, this is fantastic news. A Californian startup company has made history by bringing the first lab-grown meat to consumers in Singapore. This is the world's first approval of cultured meat, which has the potential to disrupt the devastatingly cruel, unjust, and environmentally damaging animal agriculture industry. Of course, it would be wonderful if people acted now to free our animal comrades from captivity, harmful eugenic breeding programs, and brutal slaughter, not waiting for cultured meat to arrive, as most of us don't need animal protein, but considering the cognitive dis that is ever present in our species of society, this alternative cannot be ruled out soon enough. And some animal comrades have been thriving this year. Surima's ringed seal population has had a very successful breeding season, with many more births than previous years. This is due to the fact that there was a greater amount of sea ice this year compared to previous milder winters. These cute comrades should give us that much more motivation to destroy our growth-based clusterfuck of an economy that is driving catastrophic climate change and live in reciprocity with our relations. This last amazing and inspiring story was sent in by a listener in Austria, where the Association Against Animal Factories successfully forced a stay of the canned hunting ban. In December 2020, the Social Democratic government of the state of Bergenland quietly tried to overturn the hard-won ban on canned hunting, a practice dating back to the Austro-Hungarian monarchy, where the aristocracy would breed wild animals in a fenced-off area, and at certain times of the year, herd them using loud noises and dogs toward a barrage of hunters that would shoot them one after the other without any animal having a chance of escaping. It was a sport for the rich, done for easy and guaranteed trophy hunting. In the biggest canned hunting ground in Bergenland, a single capital deer trophy would go for 22,000 euros. The Association Against Animal Factories opposed them with a campaign strategy that has so far never been tried in Austria. They collected signatures to force a legally binding popular vote against this law from the ground up. It would have been the first of its kind since usually popular votes can only be called in by governments, parliaments, or the president. It was an incredibly difficult and costly undertaking. In just eight weeks, they needed to collect 12,000 signatures in a very rural and decentralized area of only 250,000 voters. The people signing it needed to fill out two lengthy forms, and each of them needed to be individually brought to the specific local town or village office to be checked and then handed to a state government agent. And all of that had to happen over the course of several lockdowns as there was no way of doing it digitally. They heard from government and parliament insiders that no one thought they could pull it off. However, they ended up reaching their goal two weeks ahead of time and ended up with 26,000 signatures or roughly 10% of the entire voting population. Trying to avoid the public relations disaster of being the target of the first ground up popular vote, the government entered talks with activists which they refused to do before. In exchange for not going through with the vote, they agreed to activist demands and held a joint press conference with them. This was an inspiring campaign and will hopefully serve as a message to all other government levels that the animal rights block shouldn't be underestimated. Comrades, if you have good news from the current month, please send your stories to veganvanguardpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you to Javi for the positive news jams. Thank you to Halcyon for the positive news background. And thank you to Tristan for editing this video. Thank you also to our lovely patrons. If you would like to become a sustaining member, you can go to patreon.com slash positive leftist news. Sometimes. Sometimes.